But as it comes back into, uh, I guess you could say COVID normal now, where things are open and people are allowed to go back out again, it's meant that we've had to go back to employ people and certain staff that have had this whole time off on Job Seeker aren't necessarily willing to come back to work because they still have a lifeline when it comes to an income. Today on Dirty Linen, we are heading to one of my favourite parts of Victoria and therefore one of my favourite parts of the world. It is East Gippsland, uh, Bairnsdale or near Bairnsdale where the Wayang Hotel is and we are talking to its owner, Jackie Allen. Welcome, Jackie. Thank you. I was really a little bit baffled and excited to learn that Bairnsdale, which is a town that I go to at least once or twice a year, has got a pub in it or just outside it that I don't know about. And it just sounds absolutely awesome. So tell me a little bit about your place. Well, we are a little bit off the beaten track when it comes to Bairnsdale, but we are still here. Um, We're very much a locals pub and we're very... We're a very traditional country pub, so we know we don't have pokies and things like that. We're all about the beers, the good times, good food and good music. So that's, that's excellent. Yeah. I, I mean, it's great to have a pub with a focus on music. Do you get local acts or acts from further afield? What's the, what's the story there? Um, a bit of both. Um, we definitely do, you know, like the, the classic cover bands on the Friday, Saturday night. Um, sometimes we do DJs, um, sometimes big artists and things like that. Um, and we've also done a festival here, which was like John Butler, Pete Murray. So we've, we've gone all out as well. Mm, so cool. So at the start of this year, Bensdale was really impacted by the bushfires. Can you tell me about summer and how that all shook down for you? Yeah, summer was pretty rough for us. Um, like not so much for our pub in particular, but this area in general really relies on the summer trade and the tourists and all those people travelling through. And this year it was a non-event. Um, the bushfires were incredibly close to us. We lost a lot of houses um, and a lot of livestock and things like that. Uh, where we are located here in Wyong, uh, the closest fire that we had was the Clifton Creek one, which pretty much decimated the entire town. And it's just a couple of kilometres away from us. So um, our summer was pretty much just a big ball of fire, really. Yeah, it was really devastating and there was a lot of smoke around um, and, and a lot of people evacuated to Bansdale as well, didn't they? So it was definitely, yeah. yeah, just, it was just, I mean, there wasn't really anything else to do except deal with that situation, right? It was quite frightening. It was um, quite horrific to be outside, to be in the smoke. Um, you couldn't really see anything. It always looked like night time with like a, a weird orange tinge and it's just quite scary. Like you, you don't have your senses about you. So it really wasn't appropriate for holiday makers to stay here. And those that were still here had really no choice but to go to the evacuation centres. So, um, it, yeah, it just, it was not a very nice situation. It wasn't a, a very nice couple of months here. Mm. And then, as we well know, 2020 just kept on giving. Um, oh, it's the it year. Was, <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't long after that where we tumbled into the pandemic um, tell me about that. Like, you know, I mean, you, you, there's not even time to – recovery had barely commenced, right? I mean, there's, it, the, yeah. I think when we were in the midst of the bushfires, you just sort of knew it was going to be like 10 years really to start really thinking you'd put them behind you. But then all of a sudden you're into a really unprecedented crisis that nobody had any experience in dealing with and yet we had yeah, to. Yeah, that's right. Well, I mean, we, we do live in a, bush, a bushfire-prone area and it does happen quite regularly. Like I've lived here for most of my life and I've remembered a lot of summers of the fear of bushfire getting close to you. Um, but a pandemic was something just so unknown and scary, I guess it was. Everyone was so afraid when it first came about and like with the restrictions that all came in and everything, no one really knew what you were allowed to do anymore and everything you did felt illegal so there was a big fear about can you even go to the pub and get takeaway? Can you go down the street to the supermarket? It was it was scary and everyone was looking at each other like we, you know, like everyone else was sick, even if you weren't. Yeah, 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 that's right. So 
I mean, just pulling back a little bit, Jackie, you've got a lot of stuff going on beyond the pubs. Do you want to just put us in the picture of, you know, yourself and your various enterprises? Yeah, so I, a bit of a nutcase with when it comes to my life, I I own the Wyong Pub, which I purchased when I was 24 with my partner. Um, so we've been here for five and a half years now. I own two sushi shops, one in Bansdale, one in Sale. I also um, have a music festival. So I've done Live on the Hill here in the pub and we've done Lemonade in Sale, which unfortunately for us was the week before the restrictions came into full effect for coronavirus. So it deeply in- impacted us there. Um, and I have a two-year-old. I mean, you're a bit of a maniac, let's be honest. Like what, <laughs> what, what, uh, what, how come you're like this? What made you buy a pub at the age of 24? I mean, honestly, even doing anything with a partner at the age of 24, I just can't even imagine. I was no way ready to be so committed and focused and organized, let alone solvent at that age. How did you, um, yeah, how did you do all this? Uh, oh, oh, I guess we live a pretty different life to most people. Work has been a really big part of what we do and we really care about our jobs and things like that. And uh, we were working for, we were running a pub in Western Australia and we just got to a point where like, if these people can own a pub and, you know, run this from the sidelines and things like that and have people like us in here, why can't we do this ourselves and run our own pub? And, you know, we looked into it and it just felt like it was a pipe dream and it was really not going to be possible. And my partner's parents, they're like, no one will ever take a punt on you if you don't if you don't really put your heart into it. So we will help you. And with their help, we were able to buy a pub. Oh, awesome. And he's French, right? He is. He's actually not Australian at all. He is 100% a French man. <laughs> so, and are his parents here or are they over in France? So his mum came to visit him about seven years ago um, and fell in love with Australia. She's like, I'm done with grey, boring, cold France. I want to move to Australia. So she currently lives in Brisbane with uh, her husband and two of her daughters. And um, they're actually moving here next year. And oh, it's a sunny band style. Amazing. Imagine like, you know, being a, a French woman and thinking, looking, you know, wondering what was going to happen to you in your life, but you really wouldn't have thought that you would um, be an investor in a pub in uh, sunny Bairnsdale, Victoria, Australia, <laughs> would you? No, you wouldn't have thought that. But the the worst part is that we delved in a little bit further and we became the landowners too. So after about a year of running the pub as uh, like the leaseholders, um, we approached our landlord and we're like, do you maybe want to sell us this beautiful little piece of land? And he said, yes. So we own the whole thing now. That's really incredible. I mean, there's so much about this story that is great. Um, one of them is that, you know, a lot of people leave the country for the city. Like you've really invested in the town that you grew up in and, and made something else great about it. Not only that, like the town's near there. So Sale, which is, um, yeah, I guess a little bit closer to Melbourne um, and yeah, it just really, I'm just so impressed to be honest. It's really fantastic. And it's interesting, you know, I really want to talk to you about, about, you know, retaining staff through this, finding new stuff, uh, as you come out of, um, the shutdown. And, you know, I think it's going to be such an interesting thing to touch on given that you are, uh, so industrious and, you know, just a person that obviously makes stuff happen. Um, so, yeah, it must be interesting to be an employer when um, you uh, will be very quick to realise that not everybody shares the same attitude. Um, but let's not talk about that straight away. Yeah. Let's talk about, you know, how you got through the, the shutdown. Uh, so the shutdown itself, when it originally started um, back in March, um, you know, we were coming off the back of Lemonade, our music festival, which... Um, was heavily impacted by coronavirus. So we were pretty down and we were pretty like, oh, what is this? What is this the world coming to? 2020 really sucks. And um, the it was a Sunday night. We were sitting at the bar with our locals and we were having a beer with them that we hadn't for ages. And Dan Andrews popped up on the TV and he's like, I'm really sorry to announce, but starting from I think it was like tomorrow or they may have given us a few days, all hospitality needs to close across Victoria. And it was just devastating. We're like, what 
are we going to do? Like we cannot survive without our business. And, you know, we're pretty down in the dumps for about a day, maybe day and a half. And we're like, no, if this is the way it's going to be, we need to be reactive and we need to do something. So let's be imaginative. And I, as a past McDonald's manager, I'm I'm always quick to be like, at McDonald's, they do this and, you know, procedures and everything like that is really strict and it, it makes it flow. And I always get the, yeah, yeah, yeah. But this time when I suggested a McDonald's style takeaway, Everyone was like, you know what? That actually could work. We have a really big car park. We have a bottle shop that you drive through. We can make this. People don't need to get out of their car. They don't need to get out of their pajamas. They can come. They can get everything they normally would. And we can hopefully continue on like normal. So we did. (laughs) Amazing. So you were serving like basic pub, not so basic but like you were serving your regular pub menu as takeaway through in the drive through yeah we adapted it a little bit like um you know you probably wouldn't want to get like a takeaway steak or something like that steak is something that continues to cook mm-hmm. once it's on the plate so by the time you get it home it probably wouldn't be so great so we adapted to things that are still pub fair but more travel friendly so you know we took a big range of palmers. We still kept our palmer night where we have like 20 different palmers with funny toppings and we divulged into burgers and all those kind of real pub food but something that could travel. Yeah, wow. And, um, I mean, I would imagine as a pub that drinks are obviously a big part of, you know, what you do, who you see yourselves at and, of course, your income. Um, I imagine that was pretty different. How did how did that side of it go? Well, food is not really our main part of our trade in normal times it hasn't been um we're very much a drinking pub we're very social so food is probably about 30 percent and drinking is about 70 so to have to flip everything that we do to just be about food was very difficult but we concentrated that on the beginning and then we bought in drinks so we we started to do um take away cocktails um we you know bought out deals when it came to beers and things like that so you could add that onto your food um and Mm -hmm. I think in a way we've had to be resourceful and we've had to learn how to rejig our business. And as much as, you know, 2020 has been hard and coronavirus has been a real slug, it made us refresh in our business model and just bring it back back into line with who we are and what we want to be able to do. Right. Interesting. So so tell me how you've sort of started to climb out of it. Have you Are there things that you're doing now that you weren't doing before? Yeah. So... Um, Before, like, the pub itself, I mean, as you can imagine, everything has to be table service at the moment with the restrictions and looking into the way that we normally run the pub where, you know, in a normal bistro you line up, you order at the bar, you get your food, you get your drinks and you go sit down and everything's bought to sort of thing to having to do full table service. We're like, oh, our staff are not, you know, they've never done this before. Um, It might be difficult. They might forget things. They might forget to like check on customers for drinks and things like that. What can we do to maybe avoid that? And my partner being quite tech savvy, he, um, he found an app. So when you come to our pub now, if you're inside, you get full table service. But if you're outside, which we have a very large outdoor area, we have a beer garden and a terrace and we have the grass, um, you just order on an app and everything comes directly to you. Very cool. That's great. And I mean, you're lucky to have those big outdoor areas as well. So you can um, have reasonable numbers. Um, So, okay. So let's talk about the staffing side of things. Were you, uh, I imagine with your business, do you generally staff up more in summer? Although as we know, it was, it wasn't a a normal summer. And uh, did you have a lot of staff that were able to get JobKeeper? How did that all work? Uh, So we do have a lot of staff over the holiday periods and it's not necessarily for a tourist trade it's more for people coming back home um they do tend to come to our pub if you're a local and things like that um so a lot of our staff are in in the summertime and things like that are uni students that are coming back from from melbourne um this year just gone past we were still quite busy even with the bushfires um we did do a lot of things like helping the the CFA by feeding them and going to Clifton Creek and things like that, helping them out with um, food when they were doing fencing and everything. So we were still quite busy because we are loyal to our, to our community. Um, But with 
the the pros and cons of having staff that are transient like that meant that no one really qualified for JobKeeper. So only three staff out of about 30 qualified to be able to stay employed through that period of time where income was really unknown. So you really couldn't just put on as many people as normal. So that was a bit of an issue for us and it required really thinking about how do we staff this in the most practical way that really ensured that our business could stay profitable and be here in the long term. So again, with like the the drive through and stuff like that, it was it was work that um, like it could be done with just a minimal amount of people, and that was good for the job keeper part. But as it comes back into normal, or I guess you could say COVID normal now, where things are open and people are allowed to go back out again, it's meant that we've had to go back to employ people and certain staff that have had this whole time off on job seeker aren't necessarily willing to come back to work because they still have a lifeline when it comes to an income. Mm. So have you been like thinking, okay, yeah, we could do with some more people. So you give them a call and, um, and they're like, yeah, nah, I'm, I'm all good. Yeah. We've had a, uh, unfortunately, and it's a bit sad as an employer to know that, you've had staff that don't really care about their job, I guess, that you've called them up and we're like, oh, you know, we've got shifts available. Are you available? Are you able to come back to work? And the mentality is a bit like, "Mm, well, not really. And I'm like, oh, like, are you busy? Do you have another job? Oh, no. It's like, okay, well, I understand, you know, you're on JobSeeker. And I do, like, (laughs) as much as I personally could never not work, I do in a way, understand that when they've got that kind of lifeline, they're like, well, well, I've already got money, so what does it matter? Why should I work for it? So, you know, it's disheartening. But it also makes me as an employer put a mental note to to those people and be like, well, you know, you couldn't help us when we were in a, in a hard time. So when your lifeline runs out, am I going to be so inclined to re-employ you? Probably not. Mm. Yeah, fair enough. So... Have you been able to find enough people to to staff up? It has been very hard, very, very hard. Everywhere in this area when it comes to hospitality is looking for staff and in a lot of uh, other industries too. So we have a lot of farming around here and, of course, there's no backpackers. So who's going to pick all the salad this year? Are they going to have to waste it? I'm not really sure. So, you know, there's a lot of people around here really trying very hard to find staff that just doesn't exist at the moment. And, um, yeah, when it comes to the pub in particular, we've spoken to some of our uni students who didn't qualify for JobKeeper, um, probably didn't get JobSeeker either because they were still students, and we've asked them, can you come back, stay at your parents, work here and still study online like you you are right now in Melbourne? So um, thankfully for us, that has been able to happen for quite a few, but there's still so many positions that we need to be filled. And is, does that mean that you can't open as much as you would like? We are more cautious when taking bookings, like large, you know, like um, making sure that, like, you know, our bookings are at capacity and things like that. We're a bit more cautious to see, do we have enough staff available for this day? Do I need my parents to come and look after my child so that I can fill in? Which I'm fine to do, but as an employer, I'd much rather hire someone else and give them an income and let me work on my business rather than working in my business. Um, And so, yeah, that's been quite a hard job and task as an employer over the last couple of months in particular, trying to weigh up, do I have enough staff? Do I not? Do I need to try and hire? And when we've tried to hire, you know, we've put it out like Seek, Facebook, all those options. We've probably had maybe three people come back to us and they've usually been people that have friends working here that have said, you should come and work at the, the pub too. Yeah, right. So is it very competitive for any staff that do sort of float into town? Is everyone sort of at them? Yeah, definitely people are very much at them. I have a friend who uh, her cousin has come down from the Blue Mountains where there was no work to work here for the summer and she's in my shop in Bansdale and she also works at the pub and she walks into a cafe and people are like, oh, you're new. Do you need, do you need jobs? Do you need work? And she's like, oh, you know, um, I already have work, but thank you. So, you know, people are really jumping on 
anyone and being like, come on, please, guys, we just, we need staff. And it's frightening to think of what it's going to be like in summertime when everyone from Melbourne comes down here because you can't travel. So the whole area is booked out and none of us have staff. I mean, apart from the impacts that it has on you as a business owner that you've spoken about, what what do you think of the impacts that it has sort of on the industry more broadly, well, I guess the tourism and hospitality industry? I'm just scared of the impact of the summer part where, you know, people from Melbourne come down and there's not as many things open or for as long or, as you know, the wait period is much longer than it should be for food or drinks because there isn't enough staff available at the moment. Is it going to really give them a positive look on our area and be like, oh, yeah, I might come back here at Easter time or I might come back next summer? Or are they going to be like, eh, you know, it wasn't that great. You know, there's not that many people living and working in this town, so it's too busy. They can't handle this many people. Um, and that, as as someone who's grown up here really worries me because our area depends so much on tourism. Mm. I mean, I guess the fact that there's no backpackers and a lot of internationals left is, um, is a part of what's happened. And I guess, it, you know, you could say, uh, people say, oh, well, that's great because we can employ locals and train up kids who perhaps haven't worked in hospitality before. But I suppose one thing that concerns me is that, you know, when you've got when you lose those experienced people, as much as it's great to have new blood coming through and you always need that, but when you lose those experienced people, you, the standard isn't what it was. So people that have expected a hospitality experience or a tourism experience at a certain level, perhaps um, it won't be, yeah, it won't, just won't be as good as it was last year or as good as they hoped it might be this year. 100%. Having been in it, like I used to work in Port Hedland in Western Australia, which was really, um, it's a mining town and has a lot of transient workers um, there like coming through to the bars and work and things like that and a lot of European, Canadians and Americans and things like that and they have a much different standard of hospitality than we do in Australia and they're very attentive to customers and things like that and I know people, particularly Australians, are very quick to jump down, oh, backpackers take all our jobs and things like that but that's not true. Those are people that are coming here and particularly farm work. Like how many Australians actually want to go and pick strawberries, blueberries, lettuce, things like that? Probably zero. But these people come here, they get their ability to do a second year by doing these slightly less impressive jobs. But then they can also do second jobs like work at pubs and things like that. And they actually really do help to not only train Australian staff to the standard of, say, Europe, America or Canada, but they also fill in a role that, you know, like a busy period, they can come and we don't necessarily feel horrible for telling them, like, oh, I'm really sorry, but there's no more work at the moment. Whereas, you know, you employ an Australian person, they, they're living here, they're hoping to be able to work there for a longer period of time. And a transient worker is good for that, that you can just say, I'm really sorry, work is dried up here, maybe it's time for you to move somewhere else. And they're, they're fine. Mm. Yeah, sure. That makes sense. I suppose with the uni students, if they're going back to going back to study at the end of summer, then that you'd feel okay about that as well. But I certainly understand it if someone's, and I suppose it's also for a person, you know, would they apply for a job if they only knew it was for a few months? That would suit some people, but it wouldn't suit a lot of people who are living in a community and wanting to, yeah, make a living in that, in that community. Yeah, definitely. And it is also part of why you look at a small regional area like here, where it's busy and just burst that a lot of people don't actually hold a job down for a long period of time and they just float through different venues regularly. So they might stay for a few months, they might stay for a year, but they never really hold one position down. And it does come from the fact that work is not always consistent, but it also comes from maybe a lack of skills as well. Do you have the skills to be able to do multiple things when it is quiet? Maybe not. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Interesting. So, you know, if there was a, a young person listening to this uh, uh, who wanted to learn from your experience, you've obviously done so much in, you know, a short period of time and must have taken an incredible attitude into the, your workplaces. What would you say to people? Like what's been the secret of your success of being able to, you know, create so much at such a young age? I think for me personally, when I look at myself compared to the younger generation of people that I employ and something that I always try to find in people that I am employing is people that 
are willing to just give anything a go and nothing is really below them. So, you know, being a publican, I didn't start as a publican. I started as a receptionist at a hotel and then I started to learn how to do functions and events. And then I worked in the kitchen as extra shifts and then I learned how to work in the bar. And I, I just worked my way up by learning different roles and never feeling that anything was beneath me. Same with like, how do I open a sushi shop without having learnt how to make sushi? Like I started from the bottom. I learnt how to wash rice and I did that for about six hours straight. And I worked my way up until I learnt that this is, you know, how you run a sushi shop. Mm. Do you reckon you could have applied that interest and, and um, application to any industry or was the was the um, food and hospitality something that just really lit you up right from the beginning? Well, I mean, I started, you know, like as a 15-year-old working at Woolworths on the checkouts and then, you know, one day they were short in the deli and I'm like, I'll put my hand up, I'll learn. And then from there they're like, oh, we need someone in grocery. I'm like, that's fine, I'll learn how to stack shelves properly. So I don't think it just sticks to hospitality for me. I think it's just a mentality of I I can learn new things and I'd like to learn new things because if I can learn something new, I can get somewhere further. Mm. Yeah. So why don't you think everyone's like that? Oh, I don't really know why people don't have drive compared to some others. I know some people are just really content with the bare minimum. Like, you know, they get to do their thing. They get to be able to survive and what they've made and just get through life. But I guess some people, I don't know, they just don't have as much drive as others, I guess. But like I I personally, I'm 30 years old now and it's my goal to be able to buy a house. And I don't mean buy a house with a mortgage, but to buy a house outright. I want to be able to have, you know, a new car when I want to buy a new car. And I want to be, to know that I did that myself and I didn't rely on my parents or I didn't rely on anyone else. So I'm not, I'm not sure where some other people just have that like, oh, well, I've got enough. Or to the other extreme where they just blame everyone else and be like, well, that's not fair. I don't have that. You have a new house, you have a new car, and I didn't get that. But they don't really see the other side of it where you've actually worked your butt off and you've sacrificed so much to get to there. Yeah. Well, this has obviously been a, a super challenging year. But tell me about the satisfactions that you've had through this period. Oh, it has been whew, a year, that is for sure. And I know it has been for so many people, but it's been really nice as a couple who own a business like a pub where we were kind of getting to the point where we were ready to sell it. We were feeling a bit stale. Um, and with everything that's happened with coronavirus and the restrictions and having to adapt to it, we have breathed a whole heap of new life into our business and it makes us happy to be here again. We're like, you know, we've been closed for a little bit of time. So we've been able to do some renovations that we've really wanted to do. Um, you know, we have a big beer garden. We've been able to put a roof over it thanks to the government grants and things like that for like uh, making outdoor spaces. We've been able to finish those little jobs and it just, it brings a good win to you as a business owner. you be like, yes, I finally got that one thing done that I've really wanted to do here to make an impact on my business. But also as a family, it's, you know, we used to work from 11 a.m. through to about midnight pretty much every day, six days a week, oh, sorry, seven days a week. And with everything that's happened, my partner's been able to say, you know what, our trade on Monday is not really strong, so how about we take a day off as a family? And all together we can spend the three of us go on an adventure, go to some other hospitality business, give them some business, go and explore our area, and just have a day off together. So that is a really big win for us personally that we've been able to maybe put work aside for just a little bit of time and bring back a little bit of balance into our life. Yeah, brilliant. That's so good. So next time I come to Bansdale, I'm going to find your pub. Is it one of those places, you know, you said it's for locals, you know, I'm going to walk through the door, a stranger. Is everyone going to turn their head and look at me and is the room going to go silent because I'm from out of town? <laughs> well, funnily enough, that's exactly how I felt when I walked into the pub to view it for the very first time as <laughs> really? a pr prospective buyer. But I don't believe that's how people feel now. And we do, you know, we do get tourists every now and then. We, I mean, probably have more than what we realise. Um, but you you walk in and, you know, it's warm. It, it feels, it's not, we didn't make a modern pub. We made a improved 
original pub. So, you know, everything is the same as you'd think from like an old school pub. It's just clean and <laughs> fresh, I guess you could say. <laughs> Awesome. It sounds great. And yeah, I can't wait to get down there. Jackie, thank you so much for sharing your story today. And uh, yeah, giving us a little taste of the Wayang pub. It just sounds really awesome. And I'm really impressed with what you guys have built and continue to create and craft. Thank you very much for chatting. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thanks. This is Dirty Linen and I'm Danny Vallant. We air the issues that the hospitality industry finds hard to talk about. We spend a week thrashing around each issue, hearing from different people with unique perspectives. We want to hear from you as well. If you have something that needs to be said about a topic, get in touch so we can include your perspective. Contact us at dirtylinen at deepintheweeds.com.au or hit us up on Insta at Dirty Linen Podcast. We can't wait to hear from you. This is a Deep in the Weeds production.